So the title for today's sermon is A Time to Embrace and a Time to Refrain from Embracing. That's taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, which talks about a time for everything. And so this comes under that heading and covers um, the specific aspect of embracing and refraining from embracing. And we're going to look into that today, looking at what that means, looking at examples in the word of God and what that means for our daily life and relationships, um, but also how that takes us to our destiny. So what God has to say for us there. So Ecclesiastes chapter three, I'm going to read from there. Um, it's verse eight that, sorry, verse five, that is which says the embracing and a time to refrain from embracing. However, I will read the whole chapter just for context. So Ecclesiastes chapter three, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. And then here in 5b, which is a title of the topic, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. So a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. We're looking at the topic of friendship and the people we, we might walk with on our journey. Um, we want to be sure that we're walking with the right people um, to help us get to our destiny and that we're using wisdom in each relationship, uh, each situation, each conversation. And that wisdom comes from God. God is the one who can give us that wisdom. So that we choose the right people and we identify who um, on this journey is for us, who um, will help us, so to speak, and um, which relationships, which uh, interactions and engagements might draw us back from reaching our destiny. It's easy to assume or to um, get a bit of a one size fits all or one approach method to relationships. Um, and that can happen maybe after a long time, maybe we get into habits, we get familiar with certain things, used to certain routines, certain people, certain groups and, and so on, our social situations. Um, it's easy to get a, a one size fits all approach or to assume that with all situations or maybe all situations of one category, you know, with certain people, groups, etc., cetera, um, that we should approach it all in one way to embrace or to refrain. Or maybe we've been hurt by a certain situation before in the past, a certain type of person, et cetera, um, or a certain group, um, then we do that, we avoid. And so we can cast a blanket across all um, similar people and similar situations and interactions when that's not God's destiny for us. Um, so we're looking at that, you know, there's lots of nuance, essentially. And so we're looking at when do we embrace, when do we draw closer? And when should we look at another way? When should we look at a different approach? When might God be pulling us away from somewhere? Um, but essentially not just looking at it on the surface, um, not approaching our relationships on the surface and judging it by that layer alone, but we'll look at the word at how we see um, you can do that in a different way and a different level. And God can help us to make those choices that are effective by not looking at the surface layer um, of the situation, but looking deeper at the heart of the person and of the situation and quite keenly tying it into our destiny and what will take us there. Um, so we probably all experienced it at a time when we um, were in a situation, maybe we thought we should have been there and then we got out, we realized that was a wrong decision. 
and vice versa. It'd be a time we had a relationship, a friendship, whatever, and it was it seemed on the surface like the right decision and um might have been hard to like go, but then in the end we realized um sorry, that's the same. So times when we're in a, a, a situation where we think we should be there and we've left, we realized that was not right for us. And conversely, times we've avoided a situation, um, felt like we didn't want to put our feet into it. But um, in the end, we recognize that's the way God is calling us. It might have taught us something new, taken us in a different direction, but ultimately it helps us understand and fulfill our destiny. So there's many, many situations like that, and I, it's cool to look in the word of God. And we're going to look at three examples today of this, of people in a situation and they embraced or refrained. We're looking at Abraham and Lot, David and Jonathan, and Ananias and Saul when he was Saul Tarsus, becoming Paul the Apostle. So first we're going to go to Genesis chapter 13. Genesis chapter 13. And I'll read from verse 1. Maybe read the whole chapter, the context, and then we'll understand how um, Abraham and Lot um, and the, the specific situation there in here. So Genesis chapter 13 says, Then Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him. To the south, Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Verse five, Lot also who went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, <clears throat> that it was well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, oops, as you go towards Zoah. Yes. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. So we see there a specific situation between Abram and, and Lot. So Lot in the Bible is, is Abram's nephew. And we see their relationship so far. They had come together um, when they left their homeland. They'd left with their families, their livestock, all of their herd and so on, and herdsmen. And so they've come together, they're in this place. And you'd think in this situation, because they are relations, that it should just be that they stay as close together, no matter what, at all times. And 
never let anything you know separate them and that would be our wisdom or our instinct a lot of times in that situation and you think about the fact that they're away from home a place that was they're familiar with they're not there so they're away they're away from all the other relations so the wisdom would have been these two should stick together um they probably were advised as well to you know monitor each other stay close by and for abram in particular to look after lot and not you know to stay near to lot um and so that's that wisdom that's the mindset you know you can almost see how they might have been feeling uh how they've come this journey together so far and because of that journey there was a, there's a bond there's a closeness um and in, above all their relations but then how can we consider that in our day-to-day -day lives you know where there are times that we are facing someone, it's a close bond or situation um, like that, it's a relation, um, or it's someone who for whatever, any reason, you've got a really close bond with, you've come a long way together, and all wisdom would indicate that that relationship should be tied, that you, know, you two should not separate. And so what's the wisdom there, but then how does that, how does that align with the your destiny and you moving towards your destiny and looking at the situation that Abraham and Lot had here specifically? We're looking at how they had a disagreement and their livestock, their herdsmen, uh, who were looking after each his, each his livestock. And this whole camp, both camps were essentially were arguing. And this was causing, you know, disagreement, dissension in the in the camp and was leading to discord. And affecting other things but we're looking at that and we're seeing abram make making a wise decision being able to overcome that relation bond being able to look at this from god's perspective and to think about what god wants or what is right what he wants for the situation for his family for the land where they're all living and what's right he might have looked different difficult he must have looked at a lot, you know, this must have come a long journey together and he's his blood. And you can imagine how difficult that, that would be. I want us to imagine how difficult that is for us. You know, we've known someone and we've come a long way with them. There's almost no way we'd imagine um, going different paths unnecessarily. And we'd almost want to fight in every way to make it work, to make it to stay together and so on. So I don't know what wisdom Abraham had here, but we thank God for the wisdom of God he must have had to know that this was a situation where he had to quickly say, and he wasn't with much debate or with, you know, much trying to find a way around it. It was simple. In verse eight, Abraham says to Lot, he says, please let there be no strife between you and me and so on. And he just clearly says in verse nine, please separate from me. And he's not argumentative in that space. He's not um, saying, oh, maybe there's a, you know, a halfway point of this or that and so on, like bartering or, or arguing to, yeah, to maybe try and maintain the closeness, the proximity where they were staying. But instead he uses wisdom to make a clear decision and to make a clear line, a boundary, and say to Lot, you know, this is the point we've come up to. This is as far as we can go. or well, this is where we need to, make clear decisions and take different paths and that could be very difficult you think about Abram being far from his family and his homeland and so why would you separate even more from a relation you know to someone you know that's known to you so there's all this to consider and I just think about the wisdom here that we see and we look at ourselves so back to the title of a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, you know, where is that for us? Where should we look at that clear and say, I'm, I've embraced here, but maybe I should refrain. And I have this relation, this situation, et cetera. Um, wisdom says I should, I should embrace um, guidance from others and family and, and so on from around me has said I should embrace. However, what is what is the situation telling me now and what is destiny looking like if I continue to embrace? What is destiny looking like if I don't change this situation? So I think that's such wisdom that Abraham had. And I just want us to take that, take that nugget 
aware and also think for ourselves, you know, am I embracing somewhere that I sh should begin to consider, should I refrain from embracing? And what would that lead to? What would the impact of that be? What would that mean for my destiny? What would it lead to for my destiny and for theirs? Maybe it's the right choice that would take both of you to a better place in God's plan. So where can we think of that? Um, but yeah, I wanted to start with that. Abram and Lot and what it highlights to us. Looking at the wisdom there between those two um, decisions, those two paths um, of embracing and refraining from embracing. I'm going to read 1 Samuel 18. First Samuel 18, and I'll read on. It won't just be in this chapter, maybe some other chapters. But in this section, we're looking at David and Jonathan. So there's a remarkable story here of a friendship in trying times. And I'm going to read first from uh, verse one, and we'll go down and then continue where relevant through the chapters. So verse one, now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul went, wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now it had happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the woman had come out, women had come out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry and, and the saying displeased him and he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So, so David played music with his hand, as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. Therefore, Saul removed him from his presence and made him captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. So we see there in the beginning of, of 1 Samuel 18, we see there Jonathan, who is Saul's son. Um, Jonathan forming a close relationship with David, making a covenant with him and taking off his robe and his armor, uh, his bow and belt, it says. But making that commitment, essentially, um, that he would be friends with David, he would support David, he was for David. Um, and it's a really interesting situation because Saul is his dad and Saul is um, now becoming very hateful and resentful towards this David who he is making friends with. So I'm going to continue reading from verse na chapter 19 um, and we'll look a bit more into the their situation here. 
But uh, now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning, and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand before, beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine. And the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. Then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines, and struck them with the mighty blow, and they fled from him. Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Paul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing music with his hand. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall, with the, spe with the spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. I want us to look at, I think it's quite remarkable in chapter 18 and 19, we see there in the beginning, Jonathan said that he loved David as, as in his own soul. So there's a strong commitment there and a friendship is forming and he's made a covenant and given him his own armor and so on. We, in nineteen, we, chapter 19, we see how Jonathan uses his position of influence, his closeness to Saul, King Saul, who is an enemy of David at this time. We see how he uses his, his closeness to Saul and to David to warn David and to give him insight and to keep him clear and aware of when danger was coming but to try and also convince Saul, his dad, away from harming uh, David, using arguments and wisdom to try and defuse the situation there. What I think is wisdom here is, in a, for someone like David, um, the son of Jesse, and he's just conquered Goliath, so that's what got him this huge fame in Israel as well. Um, and he has many other brothers, but he's the one who uh, defeated Goliath for the nation of Israel. We see here how he used wisdom. You could have thought in a situation like that, it's so difficult. You've It says here in chapter 18, in the beginning, that um, Saul would not let David go back home. So now he's serving in the presence, in the king's palace, uh, in that position. And so in that setting, it's, you know, presumably unfamiliar. It's not um, maybe a settling environment, if especially if you've got enmity with the king, which you didn't plan for. And so in that situation, you'd be really counting who are your friends, who are your enemies, um, who can I trust, whose words are, you know, of truth, uh, you know, and carry weight. Um, because everyone will be in the in Saul's ear um, and we might want to please Saul. And so you could think, what if Jonathan is just trying to please his dad? And, um, you know, be secretive in, in, in having a friendship with David, but really his loyalty is with his dad. And so what if he's decept being deceptive? Um, what if he is not telling me the truth, David could be thinking, and just trying to get me into a position, into Saul's, uh, the same room as Saul, and Saul can spear me, and then I can be, you know, hurt out of the way. And Jonathan is closer to his dad. Or Jonathan is then more likely to get the throne. You know, what if Jonathan is thinking, and you can imagine David maybe perusing in his mind, you know, what if Jonathan is thinking these things? Really just after me to get closer to his dad and to um to, uh, to have the throne. So there's so many things that in the situation when you really think about it, 
Um, and yeah, when you think about what David, the situation he was in and the wisdom he had, that would be quite, I think, unsettling and um, yeah, an unfamiliar environment. And so he's hearing Jonathan, he's listening to Jonathan. But the interesting thing is, in a situation like this, he could have chose to refrain from embracing. But the interesting thing is, instead, he embraced um, and he had the wisdom to identify Jonathan's position in his life, Jonathan's influence to Saul in trying to get him to stop killing him, trying to chase him to kill him, and recognizing Jonathan helping him reach his destiny. So in one of these situations, Jonathan talks to his dad and is influencing him not to chase David, innocent blood. He says, David has only done good things for you. And at the end of that, Saul, you know, subsides and then reinstates David into his presence, it says. It says in verse 7, 19 verse 7, then Jonathan called David and Jonathan told him all these things. So Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in his presence as in times past. Now we know that this place, his presence in the palace, in the king's palace, was part of David's destiny and his future. So when David was called to be king, he'd been anointed for that already, and he knew that. Um, he was anointed at Jesse's house when Samuel the prophet came and said that, anointed him for that purpose. So David could be thinking, okay, I'm meant to be in this palace, or at least this is where I think God is calling me towards. And so far, I've gotten close. However, I know this is, this is happening with Saul, but look at how Jonathan is um, enabling my destiny um, in a way. So God is using Jonathan and bringing him closer to where he is destined to take position. In future, he'll be a king. So looking at that, we can look at ourselves and, and think, you know, look at our situation. Maybe there's an unusual, un, uncommon relationship or friendship we have, um, or that is forming. And we naturally want to resist it. We naturally want to... Um, categorize it you know a certain way maybe from someone like that in the past we've been hurt you know if he's if he's looking at Jonathan and thinking hmm you're the son of a king who is my enemy why would I normally associate with an enemy you know we could look at someone in a similar fashion we could think you look like this from the past you could be thinking this etc um but not recognizing all the things that is is happening through that relationship David's recognizing what is happening through Jonathan and this unusual friendship um, that's that started and recognizing how it's bringing him to his destiny, how it's being used to bring him to destiny. So where, how can we look at that in situations? Um, where can we look at that for ourselves? Is there somebody who we've met, bumped into, maybe they walk in similar circles as us, <clears throat> Maybe they are supporting us to have understanding um, that we wouldn't otherwise have had. Maybe God's using them to bring us closer to other people as well, like they're a connector to other people and places in our lives that we we wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise have connection to, but which are important for our destiny. And how is God using that? The whole thing is, how is God using that, so to speak? You know, we can look at, at that. The other thing is, look at Jonathan's heart. Um, David can look at Jonathan's heart and see he loves me as his own soul. He's the Bible says that we have to love other people as we love ourselves. So where is that evidence? Look at Jonathan. Look at how he's loving David, protecting him, literally physically um, equipping him with his armor and, and other things, and influencing others to David's benefit. So looking at that in a similar situation, you know, where can we look and see? This person isn't just saying things with their words, the actions, they follow it with their actions. Um, they're making a difference with other people, even for or towards me and, and my aims and for what God has for me. And so where is God working through all of this? Where can we look at that and line that up, line up that evidence and overcome fear and suspicion and unnecessary, you know, that unnecessary whirling that can happen in our heart and mind? Um, to really see the evidence and see God's work and recognize the purpose of a relationship. And so what is God doing with it? So it obviously takes wisdom in all of these things. The Bible says we shouldn't uh, trust in the arm of man. Um, so like to wholly trust or lean on man. And so wisdom is necessary. 
it's not saying that you put me, David put all his hope in Jonathan necessarily or that he gave him all his secrets or, you know, did things like that that might, be, might seem unwise and unbiblical too. But looking at the word and balancing that up, it's interesting to see how God uses Jonathan, how David has the wisdom to embrace um, Jonathan and um, how it brings things to pass. Um, so that's what we can also consider, you know, where can we apply wisdom to not lean on people 100%, to not trust in the arm of man as the Bible and commands us not to, and to still have our trust in God. It's God ultimately who is working our destiny, um, but to also not blind our eyes to the different ways that God can work that might seem unfamiliar, uncomfortable, and even give us fear somehow in our heart if it's if it triggers something from a past negative experience. Um, but how can we trust in God's plan and follow, you know, the, the help and support he has given us to reach our destiny? So the third one I wanted to read on is Acts chapter 9. This is looking at Saul after he has converted. Saul and then Ananias and God's use of Ananias in Saul's life. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any way, any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goods. So he trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But he led them, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptised. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. 
in this situation, we see Ananias in an unusual situation. Um, it seems one day he is praying and God says to him in a vision, God calls his name and tells him something to do, a task. But we see how unusual that was. God was asking him to go to someone who was arresting uh, the disciples, arresting people like him, Ananias. And you can see the um, the worry or the, the stress or concern that Ananias has. And so he says back to God, um, but I've heard about this person, this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Israel, and that he has he's going to be arresting people essentially and binding them, taking them back, who he finds that are of the way who follow Jesus. And so there's a lot of fear. And you can imagine Ananias having that crossroads and a tricky, you know, consideration. He knows the Lord and he's been this hearing the Lord, listening to him. And so he has that ability to understand, to hear, recognize God's voice, which is very important in a situation like this. And so he is unable to make, make the right decision. In a situation like this, he chose to embrace instead of refraining from embracing. And we see how from a destiny point of view, that was important for Saul's destiny and Ananias' relationship with God in listening to and obeying God. So I want us to consider for ourselves where there are times, there have been times, maybe there's a time now for you or it's something in the past or could come. But when, like Ananias, have you, do we need to make that decision to take a step into a fear zone, into a place that people like us, that sorry, people like you, whatever use of it, um, define that as, you might think. So Ananias here is a disciple and Saul is persecuting the disciples. Where might you associate yourself with something whereby an enemy of that something, you know, you would not normally associate with, you would not normally go near, um, be close. Um, there's no reason you'd be going and finding out that person and getting near to where their premises are. When, where do you have that, um, that situation or a nudge on your heart or a, an impression where for whatever reason you believe with God and God's leading, it's the right decision to take, to take a step into that fear zone, into that proximity to an enemy or to people who are considered enemies, um, to someone who you think is out to hurt you, um, based on the knowledge you've had prior. Um, of course, with Ananias here, that knowledge was accurate up until probably the day he had that vision and the day God spoke to him as Saul had now been met by God and was fasting and was and praying um, and was now one of the disciples, so to speak, but it wasn't fully, he didn't know yet how he was going to go about the faith. And so Ananias is acting on knowledge, prior knowledge that was accurate up until a point, the point he got that vision. But at that point, you know, he's been led by God um, and everyone around him could have thought he was stupid, could have, you know, if they knew, I don't know if they knew, you but they you can imagine they could have been saying everything against going towards Saul why would you come to the one person who is out to get us all haven't you seen what he's done to us you know there must have been a lot of terror he had reigned on the churches on the Christians uh, the men women children in that place and we've seen that and we see that in a previous chapter about him burning churches and things like that so the church what would they have been saying to Ananias um, but Ananias has this relationship with God and he hears God, he understands God. And so in that situation, he chose to embrace instead of refraining from embracing. Where does that happen or need to take place for us? Where are we afraid to um, to cross a line? Where are we afraid to, to meet or to talk with someone? Where are we you know, scared for our lives, which is natural, but... God is leading us into a situation that will save someone, that will align with our destiny and with theirs, and that will help, you know, increase God's kingdom and bring more souls into the kingdom of God. We know God's plan for the world. We know he came to die and he, for people's sins, and he gave the church the great commission. So that's who we are, soul winners. And at times we may have to cross lines that 
are fearful that take us into that, you know, a zone of trepidation and fear, but God is calling us there and God equips us for it and gives us grace and wisdom. And um, that allows more people to come into the kingdom of God. And I want us to think about that and understand where might God be, um, be asking that of you individually, of of believers in general, of the church and globally and so on, you know, there's so many implications to this. But if you're thinking about that for yourself, you know, where is where is that on your heart? Where has that impression been? Uh, that nudge, if there is one. Um, and I think it's really important. And so in this situation, it's also really important to separate between are we in the flesh or are we in the spirit? Um, as we're thinking through things and as we're in situations of decisions, you know, of like, should we embrace, should we refrain from embracing, should we get close, should we keep distance? And as, as, as we said in the beginning, it's not always obvious on the surface, just looking at it by how it appears. Um, it's not always obvious from that surface layer what the right decision is. But if we are in the flesh, um, we'll probably, probably be thinking about it from the wrong perspective. Um, and if we're in the spirit, God can help us to be in the spirit to be able to understand what is the right choice, what's the right decision that will be right for destiny and for God's plans for everyone. So there's that differentiation to make too. You know, God can help us. If Abram had been in the flesh, perhaps he would have stayed a lot. Perhaps it would have been more disruption and more confusion for all their uh, families and herdsmen. And it would have taken Abram away from destiny and lot away from destiny, perhaps. Looking at um, David and Jonathan, if David was in the flesh, maybe he would have stayed away from Jonathan, would not have had the intel and the support to um, to keep to stay alive with what Saul was trying to do to him. So if he had been in the flesh, we can see he would have could have made a very different decision, but he was able to um, stick by God's plan, stay by God, use wisdom and um, recognize Jonathan as a friend and not an enemy in that situation, though he could have looked like an enemy to anyone. And similarly, in Acts with Ananias and Saul, if Ananias had been in the flesh, he wouldn't have gone most likely to Saul's, uh, this place where Saul was staying. He would have um, overlooked the voice he heard and maybe dismissed it and be thought it's a lie, it's from the enemy or something else, um, and not have heard God's call and had an opportunity to bring someone into the faith, to welcome someone into the, into the believers in that place who ended up having huge impact, building lots of churches and writing so much of the New Testament. So it's all about, you know, what, what is God planning for us? We can't always see it on the surface layer, but that extra element of thinking, am I in the flesh or am I in the spirit can really help us to um, make that decision truly. And so we want to look, we need to look at that. And um, as we've said, you know, this is all tied to destiny and the purpose of friendships. Linking to the flesh spirit, sort of contrast again. When we look at friendships as a whole, you know, we can ask God to help us understand and to examine how are we deciding and choosing our friends? How are we defining what friendship is? So taking it outside of a context or outside of a relationship with God, if we don't have that or we're not thinking about it in light of relationship with God, um, taking outside of that, we can see friendship as just something to fulfill our own needs, something in a selfish sense, something about just just about that person and you and what you both want and what you what feels good for the moment and what you enjoy and not necessarily evil things that can even be noble, but it can be sinful. It can be if it's about just self and I and and the flesh. You know, if God is not working in that. Um, and we don't sort of hold up our friendships to God and recognize that all our interactions on a day-to-day -day basis affect us and who we are and how we think and affect our destiny um, and really impact that, then without doing that, we can fail to see clarity in our friendships. We can fail to have the right basis and foundation for how we move in this life and pick friendships. Um, and that can lead to more problems. So it's also God helping us there. Maybe it's not something we've considered before deeply. It's something we take for granted. Uh, we probably 
um, took it for granted if from a young age, we just, you know, I've been doing friendships as the world tells us to do friendships and um, never really considered it or taken a step back. But as God is in our lives, and as we know, he wants to, as he sort of permeates all our lives, um, then he also has a thing to say about how we pick our friendships. And he wants that to also affect our destiny in a positive way. So it might not be that you're thinking about one specific situation, you know, like these, like we've looked at today, but in a general sense with friendships, how are we, how are you considering that? Is it an area that you've lifted up to God um, and considered from a perspective of your relationship to him? Uh, is it something that you've taken seriously from th that thought and from your walk with God? What does God want for it? And he helped me to make sure they align with my destiny and help me reach destiny. Um, and how can they not be selfish? So not just being about I and, and you know what feels good for the moment, what our wants are, both people in that friendship, but always aligning with God. So I want us to go into time of prayer. We've got we've got time to go into ample prayer. And so I want us to just think about what this means. To recognize that God may have friendships he wants to bring into our life or remove from our life um, that will help us from a destiny with our destiny but it's not just about us and so what is he saying what is he saying and is it that this message is at this time to prep your heart your awareness your spirit to hear him like Ananias could hear God and make the right decision. And it's not that we'll always be perfect in making the right decision. But it's about the fact that we've invited God into that area, that space of our friendships and into the area of our lives and any area we invite him into and we allow him to have rain, full rain, it turns out better. Where can we reflect on what Abraham, David, and Ananias did? And when they chose to embrace, and when they chose to refrain from embracing. And how they overcame superficial perspectives that could have um, been in their mind, or could have been in coming from around them and either worldly advice or friends and family's advice or um, religious people's advice, whatever it was, how did God give them wisdom around the situation? So that they could hear him 
and not be distracted to follow. To follow a path that wasn't from God. How did they use that to align with and reach their destiny? How did they align with the spirit and listen to the spirit and also follow, look at the evidence and look at how that lined up? How did they not choose fear for making their decision? But choosing righteousness and using God's grace to walk in that situation. And how can that help us in our day-to-day -day lives? in recognizing and having discernment. How can God give us strength to overcome when it's our weakness, when our weakness undermines us making the right decision. And how can God help us have more light and more life in our relationships? In the people we have around us, that they give us strength, that we, we draw on it for strength. God uses it for that purpose, to enliven us, to, to take us take us more into fellowship with God and with others, to make us more effective.
Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we are grateful for this uh, time and this sermon on a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. And we bless you um, because you're always working in our relationships um, to help us be the people you want us to be and reach our destiny and to stay close to you. We pray you'll help us to learn from these examples and stories in the Bible and from any of the situations you have us in as well on how to pick and choose our friendships and where we should move close, where we should stay away, etc. cetera, um, by your wisdom. And I pray that above all of it, we'll maintain our full trust in you, um, not in man, as your word says, and that we'll endure until the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.